Right. Hello, everybody, and we're 15 minutes later than we normally would be, but uh, exigencies of life have dictated a slightly different start time. So hope you can, uh, there's so much here, and we'll see what it is we can actually do. This marvelous uh, Rorick painting of the masters carrying something of great importance. Yeah, something luminous. Well, we have discussed the very first phase of the uh, fivefold ceremonial process, and that is the revelation of the presence, whatever that presence may be to you when you um, engage imaginatively in the ceremony that is being created for you. Let us see what the presence will be. Now we go to the second part. It's called the revelation of the vision. That's so important. I mean, even in our non-initiatory life, the revelation of the vision keeps us going. When the vision closes down, you know, a tunnel, what does it say? The, the, the tunnel seemed to close, the opening dimmed its light. The vision he had seen no longer shown. This is the unhappy realization that comes to the sixth ray type when he no longer has something to chase after. And all of a sudden it all just shuts down and nothing external lures him onward. Fortunately, however, something arises from within his heart which uh, directs him. This is uh, found in the laws of repulse that we went over last year. Esoteric psychology number two is a real gold mine of um, advice about how to tread the path. And it's couched in that ancient language that the Tibetan has translated for us. <coughs> Excuse me. In a very beautiful way, I think he was some kind of Elizabethan. The the Tibetan, I think, was that. Um, he said he had two European incarnations. Now you kind of wonder what European means. Uh, the occult rumor has it that he was uh, Plotinus. You know, there was Plotinus, Proclus, and the Amblicus. Iamblichus was actually an earlier incarnation of Master Hilarion. I don't know about Proclus, but uh, the Neoplatonism of that early school would fit very well with the Platonism of the uh, Tibetan. So we'll, we'll wait to find out who he was. It could be interesting, but uh, I guess knowing who he is now is more important. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> So here we go. Having brought the initiate face to face with the one with whom he, with whom for countless ages he has had to do, and having awakened in him an unshakable realization of the oneness of the fundamental life as it manifests through all lesser lives, and I wonder how many of us have that unshakable, you know conviction of the one life. You know, I think it comes and goes. The next momentous revelation is that of the vision. The first revelation has concerned that which is undefinable, at least to the candidate. It's a, such a higher order of being. It's the fifth creative hierarchy and maybe beyond. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. The first revelation has concerned that which is undefinable, illimitable, at least to us, and to the finite mind of which we are possessed, infinite in its abstractness and absoluteness. Well, one can question the exact meaning of those words. Ah, right. But suffice it to say that what has been revealed to him is certainly abstract and beyond his complete comprehension. The revelation of the vision, the second revelation, see the first one, the first revelation has concerned um, the abstract and the illimitable. The um, second revelation concerns time and space and involves the recognition by the initiate 
through the newly aroused sense of occult sight. We have that on the inner planes. We may not have it on the outer planes until the third initiation is really taken. A newly aroused sense of occult sight of the part he has played and has to play in the plan. Now, how many of us know that with exactitude? And if we knew it from the inner worlds, would we be able to bring it through? That's really important. And later, the revelation of the plan itself, so far as it concerns his ego, capital E, his higher self, his egoic group, the other souls who are on the same ray as he is, uh, and have the same coloration and generally the same degree of evolution, his ray group, which is larger yet, and his planetary logos. So, obviously, these are step by step the revelation of ever wider understandings having to do with the divine plan. In this fourfold apprehension, you have portrayed the gradual realization that is his during the process of the four initiations preceding final liberation, meaning ego first degree, ego group second degree, ray group third degree, planetary logos fourth degree, and then something for the fifth degree, which is beyond all these. So, revelation of the vision, second phase of our um, uh, fivefold process uh, in the initiation ceremony. At the first initiation, he becomes aware definitely of the part, relatively inconspicuous, not so noticeable, that he has to play in his personal life during the period following and suing between the moment of revelation and the taking of the second initiation. That might look ahead for, you know, 20 lives. What are you going to be doing for 20 lives? Some kind of revelation of what you may be doing and the general field in which you will be working is granted. Now, maybe a few people somehow between the first initiation and the second take them quite fast. DK seems to leave open the door to that possibility, but the average, he says, is a long time, uh, characterized by the uh, life of the Master Jesus or Initiate Jesus from birth to 30 years old. And at 30 years old came the baptism, and then comes the transfiguration, then comes the crucifixion, all done within the next three years. <clears throat> so this may involve one life or several. That, that, and in, in those inner worlds, you can grasp what that is like. If you try to say to yourself, well, what am I doing right now for the next X number of lives? I think we'd have a hard time, except for wishful thinking or some kind of idea of what we might be doing, grasping what we're really doing. But apparently, on the inner, in the inner worlds, it's given to you to see because the veils are lifted for that vision. <coughs> he knows the trend they should take. He realizes somewhat his share in the service of the race. He sees the plan as a whole. Uh, where he himself is concerned, his little microcosmic self, not the vast planetary and solar systemic plan, but at least where he is concerned. <coughs> he is a tiny mosaic within the general pattern. He becomes conscious of how he, with his particular type of mind, aggregative gifts, mental and otherwise, and his varying capacities, can serve and what must be accomplished by him before he can again stand in the presence. That will be the next revelation of the solar angel as a dual being, and then as a triple being, and so forth, and then the revelation of the monad, and receive extended revelation. You don't want to go too far. If you extend revelation too far, people just get confused. Are you sufficiently confused yet? Okay, I hope confused in a higher way. All right. <laughs> I'm so sorry about this. Uh, cough, apparently. It's a cough, apparently. At the second initiation, the part in his egoic, the part his egoic group plays, mainly, I suppose, according to the soul ray, uh, in the general scheme is shown to him. And it's uh, the part of those who are associated more or less with him at the same stage of egoic unfoldment. He becomes more and more aware of the different group units with whom he is intrinsically associated. He sees them. He sees them on the outer plane. 
And maybe that has happened with you. You recognize some of the people with whom you realize you are working inwardly, and you recognize them on the outer plane. That's a, when those two things line up, you have a real possibility of constructive work. He realizes who they are in their personalities. If in incarnation, which is not necessarily the case, and he sees somewhat what are the karmic relations between the groups, units, and himself. Well, we all work through a lot of group karma. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? And it's not always easy to do, but we're members of the same egoic group to a certain extent, and we somehow make it through. He is given an insight into the specific group purpose, not just his own individual purpose, but, you know, it might be a large-scale effort in the field of education or in the field of economics or what, whatever, you know, the field of uh, rulership, of politics and all that. How to deliver the quality of the egoic group to humanity in service of the plan. Insight into the specific group purpose and his relation and its relation to other groups, he can work with added assurance. Now that's so important. D.K. told us that at a certain point it will be revealed to people uh, just what the inner occult facts are. So they're serving, but they don't work with real positivity because they don't know how well supported they are and what they really are. The occult facts are given to them, and then they work with greater assurance. That's just the way, presumably, we are doing. You know, we have some degree of assurance. <laughs> okay, uh, he can now work with that assurance, and his uh, intercourse with people on the physical plane becomes more certain. He knows what he's doing with the people he meets. He uh, can both aid them uh, and himself in the adjusting of karma. It's a big thing about the second initiation and karma. A lot to work through there. Therefore, bring about a more rapid approach to the final liberation. By that, I, I think pretty well he means mastership, by the final liberation. It's not final by any means, but final relatively. Group relations are consolidated, and the plans and purposes can be furthered more intelligently. We can work together. And this consolidation of group relation proceeds, as it proceeds, it produces on the physical plane that concerted action, that wise unity and purpose, which results in the materialization of the higher ideals. See, six ray, second initiation, materializing the ideals on the physical plane. It works that way. And the adaptation of force in the wise, notice how wisdom is coming in, finally, because when you first start to take the second initiation, you're not all that wise. But wisdom has to come in through Venus, through Jupiter, through Neptune, and not just through Mars and Pluto. Okay. The adaptation of force in the wise furthering of the ends of evolution. When he has reached, this has reached a certain stage, the units forming the group have learned to work together. Real, real cooperation and the brotherhood, you see, the, the earlier anticipation of brotherhood comes in at the second degree. It's really known at the sixth degree, when you are a full-fledged monad. Brotherhood is a monadic thing. But since the numbers are the same, two and six, okay, the monad's on the second or the sixth plane, and the second initiation is on the second or sixth plane, there's that resonant anticipation of fellowship. <coughs> and we have, you know, in, even in the Masonic ceremonies, we have a degree which indicates fellowship at the second degree. Um, so they've stimulated each other. They can now proceed to a further expansion of consciousness, resulting in a person further capacity to help. The idea is the wider your consciousness, the more you can help. The less you know, the less you can help. But we all have to help with the degree of consciousness we have. We can't say, oh, when I know more, then I'll help. No, with what we've got, we've got to help at that particular degree of expansion of consciousness. All right, revelation of the vision. At the third degree, there is revealed to the initiate the purpose of the sub-ray, of the ray to which he belongs, that upon which the ego finds itself. In other words, your soul ray is a sub-ray. It's not your major ray. Where you really find yourself is upon your monadic ray. It can be any one of the seven monadic rays at first, and then eventually, finally, one of the three monadic rays. In DK's group, number of first-ray monads, quite a few second-ray monads, a number of third-ray monads. Other than that, um, he didn't specify. <coughs> Matter of fact, he didn't specify so much 
about the monadic rays of his people where it was important, he specified. And each one of them is kind of interesting. So all the egoic units, that's all of us as souls, are on some subray of a monadic ray. Now maybe you have an idea of what it might be for you. I would suggest taking the Terra test. Uh, or maybe should I call it the Terror test? It is a, uh, it's a three-week process where you go home with this test and uh, you're, you're, you're invited to meditate on some of your higher rays. And then it's all scored. Uh, and then you can see what the tendencies seem to be, you know. Is it the third ray, second ray, or first ray monad, you know? There's not so many first ray monads, only about 5% in the solar system. Uh, the great majority are second ray monads, 35%, and some are third ray monads, 20%, roughly. Okay. <clears throat> this knowledge is conferred upon the initiate so as to enable him eventually to find for himself along the line of least resistance, the ray of his monad. In other words, if you really know your soul ray, you'll be able better to find your monadic ray. And this is coming to him at this particular point of vision relating to the third degree. Uh, so the subray bears upon its stream of energy many groups of egos, but, but they won't all necessarily be the same monadic ray. Lots of second ray souls in a group, but maybe they have different monadic groupings. There is a grouping on the monadic plane of seven different groups. You can find this in letters on occult meditation. So, you know, we all belong to one of those seven different groups, and ultimately we belong to one of the three groups up on the logoic plane. <coughs> so, the initiate is therefore made aware not only of his egoic group and its intelligent purpose, but of many other groups similarly composed, so you include more and more, and you realize more and more people are working along, even though their monadic ray may not be the same, some of their methods are the same. Their united energy is working towards a clearly defined goal. Now, mostly we don't have that. Mostly we, what am I doing, and why am I doing it, and is it working out, or isn't it working out? And the question of the larger group in which we are a part is not yet really clear. Not yet. Okay. Having learned somewhat group relations and having developed the ability to work with units in group formation, and DK is always emphasizing this. For him, the group counts, right? I mean, what, what you do individually is very interesting. You may learn a lot. But when he looks at his disciples, he looks at them in group formation and not how they just may be doing as an individual. <coughs> he says, you know, from the individual point of view, his book, Discipleship in the New Age, was a real success. But from the group point of view, not so much success, because they couldn't really pull it off in terms of the group. So let that be a lesson to all of us as we try to work within our groups. So um, group formation, the initiate now learns the secret of group subordination to the good of the aggregate of groups. See, first we have to learn how to subordinate our individuality to our group. Now there's all these groups that we're aware of, and our group has to be subordinated not to other groups, but to the aggregate of these groups. It's always a bigger and bigger picture, and gradually we are all becoming decentralized. First individually, then in terms of our groups, then in terms of our egoic group, we're getting off the center of our own stage, where we can occupy that place in the middle, and it blinds us to so many things. This will demonstrate on the physical plane as an ability to work wisely, intelligently, and harmoniously with many diverse types. You kind of feel that with the Dalai Lama, you know? He's a really an embodiment of harmony. He has this incredible kind of Cancer Libra way of dealing with uh, people that affirms what they're doing and yet points out the harmony of what they're doing with what he's trying to advance and cooperate in the large plans and wield uh, wide influence. <coughs> so we're all um, increasing our capacity to be useful, you know, even after lunch. Okay, <laughs> lunch is one of those things, you know, to you say, well, why don't you just give everybody more time off? Of course, it goes against the grain. I, I just, I, I, I said, well, look, we have to stop at 5 o'clock, you know. 
and we've got about 10 hours worth of stuff here, so, you know, so I gave you 15 minutes. I hope you're really appreciative of that. Okay. Anyway, a revelation of the vision at the portals of the fourth initiation. Through the entire uh, loosing, freeing of the initiate from all trammels, you know what a trammel is, it's a, a grip, it's like a chain on you, you know, binding you. Uh, loosing of the initiate from all tr trammels in the three worlds and the breaking of all bonds of limiting karma. You can see how Saturn and Pluto and Vulcan all get into that act, shattering the chains of karma. Uh, the vision this time is greatly extended. So, you know, you can say, well, what is my vision? I mean, what really is my vision? And how does it uh, measure up against the kind of vision that he's talking about here? And it might be said that for the first time he becomes aware of the extent of planetary purpose and karma within his planetary scheme. Not just our little Earth globe, but all those other 49 and maybe even 70, you know. There's always a, this is my, one of my rules of thumb, wherever there's seven, there's ten. Okay, so if you, you see seven visible, always assume three are invisible. So instead of seven globes, you have ten. Instead of seven chains, you have ten, three of them invisible. So, and it may even be that way for the solar logos. Thus, this, ten is the really perfect number. And seven is a number of relative perfection. <clears throat> His own personal unimportant karma, uh, DK tries to put us in our place wisely. His own personal unimportant karma being now adjusted, he can give his attention to the working off of planetary karma taking on the load not just for himself, but for greater beings, especially at the fourth initiation. <coughs> and the far-reaching plans of that great life who includes all the lesser lives, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. You get a sense of that one in whom we live and move and have our being every once in a while, you know, just you think of it and there's just one life moving everything, forcing everything to come together, one life adjusting and manipulating all things intelligently. One life, one life. But like he says, so trite and unrealized platitude, the one life. See what I mean? We can just say it, oh, it's all one, it's all one, but do we realize it? That's the thing. Okay. He has, he has not only brought to full recognition of the purposes and plans for all the evolutions upon his planetary scheme, and that's a lot. All those hierarchies, all those kingdoms of nature, <coughs> the earth, but also there swings into the radius of his grasp, his, his apprehension. That planetary scheme, which is our earth's complement or polar opposite, probably is going to be Venus. See, there's a, there's a uh, triple connection to triangle, Venus, Earth, Mars. And, and you can kind of look at it... Uh, Earth, physical, Mars, astral, and Venus, the mental body. The other triangles operating all the time, but um, we do have a uh, kind of a connection with Mars, and it's working out right now on Earth in a very challenging way. If, you know, uh, Mars came very close to our Earth uh, just a few years ago, uh, the closest it's been in 70,000 years. Now, that means, of course, Martian influence, and we see it. You know what I mean? The old methods of Mars are being uh, dusted off and reapplied as if we never learned anything from it, and we have to reassert whether we have better methods now than the old Martian methods. <coughs> he realizes the interrelation existing between the two schemes and the vast dual purpose is revealed to him. Venus, in a way, is behind all the initiatory stuff we do. Because, you know, in every solar system, there is one planet that is most closely related to the seven solar systems of which ours is one. So Jupiter, in our own solar system, is most related to our sun. Venus, in our solar system, is most related to Sirius, which is part of the seven solar systems of which ours is one. There is this local cosmic logos, and we are a heart center in that being which is why love is the big thing on our, uh, in our solar system.
and on our planet. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> okay. It is shown to him how this dual purpose must become one united plan, <coughs> and henceforth he bends all his energies towards planetary cooperation. Dane Rudyard, maybe you've heard of him, a really fine astrologer, he wrote a book called The Planetarization of Consciousness. Uh, I think he changed the name of the book later to something a little more manageable, but that was like a third degree division uh, or vision. And people said, well, why isn't Rudyard in your books, in, in your uh, groups to the Tibetans? He said, well, he's already a world disciple, meaning third degree. See, so anyway. Um, it shows him how, uh, how this dual purpose must become one united plan, and he bends all his efforts toward it uh, through the two great evolutions, human and deva, upon our planet. And it's almost like <coughs> that, see, in our solar system, there are 140 billion conscious deva units, and only 60 billion uh, human units. We live in an astral, buddhic, devic solar system. So and not all solar systems are that way. Some may have more what we call man than uh, the deva. But we have a lot of deva things, and, and we're just now beginning to learn how to work with it. In the old days, we lear learned how to command the elementals with much appropriate havoc. You know, here come the floods, here come the storms, here come the volcanoes, you know, the elementals. But if you want to work with the devas, you have to cooperate with them, not command them. So he tells us, you know, there are some of the Deva evolution who must obey. There are others with whom we cooperate, and there are others that we must obey, the greater Raja lords and so forth. All right. <clears throat> so um, this concerns the making of adjustments and the gradual application of energy in stimulation of the various kingdoms of nature. So. Um, that by the blending of all nature's forces, the interplay of energy between the two schemes may be quickened. And if you really, you know, look at it, you kind of see in the diagrams why it is that uh, Venus and the Earth are so connected. Here's the Venus uh, chain really connected with the Earth chain. And then, of course, going out to the Venus globe, and maybe there's something over here, too, um, let's see about, here's the Venus, uh, I can't really read that too well. The, is, this might be the Venus uh, scheme, perhaps, uh, looks like it. And again, it has a really strong connection with the Earth scheme. So, look, the interesting thing is, we're supposed to be as advanced as Venus, and we missed. We, we're supposed to be like twin sisters, as advanced as Venus, and because of what happened on our moon chain, we are like one whole initiatory cycle behind. We're in our fourth round, they're in their fifth round, and <clears throat> we have to make up for lost time, and that's what Venus is trying to help us do, and that's what Sirius, behind, behind it all, is trying to help us do. So in a way, there's no time to lose. <laughs> no time to lose. <coughs> so, in this way, the plans of the solar logos, as they are being worked out through his planetary logo, the various chakras, remember we're a base of the spine chakra, our big day comes when the solar logos takes his fifth cosmic initiation. Then this earth will be a hot spot, and then we will have our function, really, for kundalini within the solar system. The handling, therefore, of solar energy on a tiny scale is now our privilege, where uh, he is admitted not only into the council chambers of his own hierarchy, but is permitted entrance also when agents from other planetary schemes are in conference with the Lord of the World. So this is a pretty high stage. You can come into Shambhala. Who's a member of Shambhala? Various planetary representatives, the seven spirits before the throne, the three Buddhas of activity, the three esoteric Kumaras. These are the higher ups who are members of the of, of Shambhala, and when you are an initiate of the sixth degree, you are uh, admitted into at least some of the council of Shambhala, okay? Right now, we'd be doing well to get into the ashram, okay? <laughs>
So let's be realistic. <coughs> At the fifth initiation, the vision brings to him a still more extended outlook, and a third planetary scheme is seen. Forming with the other two schemes, one of those triangles of force, which are necessitated for the working out of solar evolution, it could be Mars, it could be Mercury. There is a kind of a Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mercury mental, Venus emotional, Earth physical. Earth is always physical. There's another triangle, Saturn, Mars, Earth. Mar uh, Saturn mental, uh, Mars emotional, and Earth physical. And these are all, you know, we have our triangles work with each other. We try to form triangles. We try to, you know, uh, send goodwill and love and all that, and they do it too. They have their triangles too on a higher turn of the spiral. So, <coughs> just as all manifestation proceeds through duality and triplicity, back to eventual synthesis, so the schemes, which are but chakras, centers of force in the body of the solar logos, work at first as separated units, living their own integrated life, just like our own chakras. They're doing their own thing until they link up with other chakras and form triangles. Uh, then they work as dualities through the interplay of force of any two schemes. Look, you've got to raise your sacral center to the throat. That's two chakras. You've got to raise your solar plexus to the heart. That's two chakras but eventually a triangle will be formed. Uh, and aiding and stimulating, complementing each other, and finally as a solar triangle, circulating force from point to point and center to center. One of those is Ajna Center, Crown Center, and um, what's this called? Alta Major Center. That's one of the big triangles, and then when that's really working, the light in the head is really going to be useful. <laughs> and the third initiation will be taken. Until the energy is merged and synthesized and the three work together in unity, we're always moving towards synthesis. We're always putting ourselves together. We people, you know, we can be isolated students of the Tibetan and work at home all by ourselves, or we can link up with other people and actually also accomplish something with them. Gradually, gradually, we enter the wider network. Triangles helps us do that. <coughs> When the adept of the fifth initiation can work in line with the plans of the three Logoi involved, let's just say they're probably going to be, well, there's definitely a, a Mercury, Venus, Earth. There's also a Venus, Mars, Earth. Cooperating with them with ever greater ability, as time passes, he becomes ready for the sixth initiation. You can spend 2,000 years as a master before you're ready to take the sixth initiation which admits him to still higher conclaves. Nine years, the big conclave is coming, 2025. And of course, all of us here on the outer plane, we have to somehow prepare for that so we can bring through whatever is suggested. He becomes a participant in solar and not just merely in planetary purposes. Remember, the monad is that which finds its home within the sun. So when you find that sixth degree, you're living as a monad, it's a very solar moment for you. And so is the seventh degree, in a different way. At the sixth initiation, the most marvelous vision of the entire series is his. He sees the whole solar system as a unit and gets a brief revealing, which opens to his amazed, um, even a master can be amazed, right? But to his amazed understanding, the fundamental purpose of our solar logos and for the first time, he sees the plans as a whole in all their ramifications for our whole solar system. Now, we may say, well, what are those things? Well, it looks like we have to wait until the inner revelation of the sixth degree occurs. If this kind of stuff doesn't give you both enthusiasm and patience at the same time, then it will have failed in its mission. <clears throat> at the seventh initiation, he goes beyond the solar system altogether in his vision. And he sees that which has long, he has long realized as the basic theoretical fact that our solar logos is involved in the plans and purposes of a still greater existence. I call that a cosmic logos. Okay? And I'll show you how I do that. I go here to a treatise on cosmic fire, and I go to page 293, and there it is. Here is a solar logos, 
And the next thing up is a cosmic logos. And it has, for its chakras, solar logoi. And our solar logos is a heart center in this great being. And, but the cosmic logoi themselves are chakras in a still greater being that he calls the unknown. And I, I would suggest to you that that is the true one about whom not may be said. Now, you know, he's saying, uh, don't talk about it. You can't. You don't know what you're talking about. One about whom not may be said. But then he gives us some information about it. <clears throat> and this goes up on higher and higher cosmic planes. So uh, anyway, we're, we're living in a big heart center. And that, that has to be remembered. Are there any questions or protests or anything that... Uh, <laughs> I, it's a lot of information, and it's just coming from that simple little book, Initiation Human and Solar, written for the general public. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just, I, it astonishes me all the time. Who is that general public that can understand this book? And that's back in 1922. That's almost 100 years ago. Amazing. So, <coughs> like I say, if you have people you study with, study this book. Because it really lays out your future and the future of everybody in a very, very coherent and precise manner. <coughs> so, a still greater existence, and that the solar system is but one of many centers of force through which a cosmic entity vastly, vastly greater than our own solar logos is expressing himself. And that could be, of course, either the cosmic logos or the one about whom not may be said. <clears throat> and if you can't say anything about a super cosmic logos, then you certainly can't say anything about a galactic logos or about a logos that, that includes seven galaxies or whatever. You know, so it applies the one about whom not may be said, you know, all the way up. You can't say anything about it, really. In these visions, visions, one great purpose underlies them all, the revelation of essential unity and the unveiling of those inner relationships which, when known, will tend ever more fully to swing the initiate into the line of self-abnegating service. He just doesn't let us alone, does he? The end of the whole thing, self-abnegating service. In other words, we, we think we're so important and yet the little self that we think we are has to be negated in the service of the larger whole. And we get tested in interesting ways. You know, we get tested with little humble tasks. And so I want to do that. But that's just on the way to something greater. And the person who performs well in the little tasks is fitting themselves for still more responsibility. And, you know, of course, we're a little bit proud. Oh, that's beneath me. I, I should be doing something else. You know, how it goes. But anyway, <coughs> so self-abnegating service, and which will make of him one who works towards synthesis, towards harmony, towards basic unity. Ray 1, Ray 4, Ray 2. That's what we're all working towards. Now, obviously, in humanity at the present time, there's no unity. You know, it's just a mess. Everybody's fighting everybody on the basis of antique ideologies that just don't come anywhere near revealing what the human mind can now reveal. And yet, you know, they're going to die for it everywhere. And that's the recrudescence of the sixth ray. You know, you're going to die for your limited ideals. Then you're going to kill everybody else you can, too. And that's important. So don't forget that. So that has to end pronto, somehow. We have to meditate to that effect so that can end in the next nine years. <coughs> Vision, past, present, and future. During the initiation ceremony, the eyes open, and you see the past. This is part of the vision. It sweeps before you. You see yourself playing many parts, all of which are realized to be but the gradual bringing of his forces and capacities to the point where they can be of service to, uh, to and with his group. He sees and identifies himself according to the particular initiation with what? Himself <coughs> in many earlier lives. What was I doing? What was my group doing in earlier lives? 
what were the members of my egoic ray doing down the many cycles, and what was my planetary logos doing as he tries to fulfill his particular task. So the vision includes the past. It includes the past. <coughs> so until he has identified himself with the past of the one life, not just his own little, little past, the past of the one life flowing through all planetary schemes and evolutions in the solar system. <coughs> and this produces in him the resolve to work off karma and the knowledge from the seeing of past causes how it must be accomplished. And I don't know if any of you or I have been seized by the desire to work off past karma, if we know what it is, but it really makes sense to do it. The, the Saturn part, look, until you climb the mountain of karma, Venus does not rise on top of the mountain, nor will the sun. So we've got to discriminate what really is the karma, what is it really, and uh, or is it something new that's being done? Because, you know, some difficult situations, it seems right, that's our fault, it's karma. But on the other hand, some new initiative of a not-so-great nature may be, may be occurring, and it's not your karma at all, you just happen to be the recipient of that particular uh, untoward uh, method of behaving. Mountain of initiation. Well, I, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I'm not sure of the word rubble, but you do climb the mountain, and you meet Venus in the supernal light. And you meet, it's like from Saturn to Venus to the sun. Finally, the sun rises on the mountaintop. After you've done the Saturnian thing of really climbing the mountain, which means expiating as you go. Oh, yeah. And it's amazing the karma or what have you, the conditioning that get cleared mm -hmm. by dressing up as what you don't like about yourself. No, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. Uh -huh. Well, you'll have your chance. We're having a little bit of a ceremony, a celebration on the last night. So you'll all get a chance to come as your higher self, as a ray, as a planet. Something high. I suppose a few people will come as the dweller on the threshold. I, I suppose, uh, uh, and, and Tui is not too keen on that idea, but you'll know who you are. And, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll have a little bit of a masquerade uh, party. <coughs> Something, somehow. It will all work out. All right, so now you have a vision of the present. You had the past, how it's all led to this present moment. The vision includes the past, present, and future. It is revealed to him what is the specific work to be done in the lesser cycle in which he is immediately involved. The vision of the work to be done. This means that he sees not only that which is, concerns him in any one life, but he knows what is to be the immediate bit of the plan involving maybe several of his tiny cycles called lives, which the planetary logo seeks to see consummated. Now, we have a tough time thinking in terms of many lives, or several. But when you're in this particular state of consciousness, you know, you, you see it all like one thing. And the lives that we live look small. And they're just steps along the way to what has to be accomplished. You know, it's like sometimes I think, I think about the field of esoteric education, which I find myself involved. I can see a number of lives which would be given to the overall unfoldment of that larger thing called esoteric education. And maybe we all have a larger thing to which our little lives will contribute, you see. <coughs> so this means, um, no, he then may be said to know his work past all doubt, <coughs> so sorry, and can apply himself to his task with a clear knowledge as to the why, the how, the when. Now, how clear are we? Hopefully increasingly clear as we get older. <clears throat> then we discover we're too weak to do anything, but at least we know what should be done. <clears throat> Can we get into that old saying that, uh, 
if uh, youth but knew, if age could do. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. But uh, and eventually, you know, every master is pretty much uh, with the Maya Varupa around the age of 35. So they generate a body at the prime of their uh, expressive capabilities. Some of the older masters who have born bodies, they have older uh, older bodies. I, the, does the Maya Varupa really age? I don't think it has to unless you want it to. So, all right. Like the Master Jupiter. They call him the old man of the Nilgiri Hills. Well, he's obviously from the previous solar system. He's the oldest of all the masters. And he, I, I suppose he doesn't look young. But, uh, but um, you know, in terms of physical appearance. But other masters look quite good, you know, and uh, they come in at their own uh, level of expression, which is at the prime of physical plane life, and they can do that. They don't get beyond 35, you know. All right. <clears throat> used, to be a, used to be a comedian by the name of Jack Benny. Yeah, how old are you, Jack? 39, he would say. <laughs> it's obviously... Uh, in his uh, 70s, <laughs> but he mm, <laughs> he got away with that for a long time. Of course, it it became a bit, you know. <coughs> so that's the present, and now the vision of the future. We all ne always need encouragement, you know. If you just tell everybody how difficult everything is, they just get swamped. So here's the encouragement. Then, for encouragement, there is granted to him a picture of a final consummation of a glory past all description, with a few outstanding points indicative of major steps thereto. Gives you the assurance it will come, it will happen, and you will do it. He sees for one brief second, doesn't have to be a long time, the glory as it shall be, and that path of radiant beauty which shines ever more and more unto the perfect day. The path of the just is as a shining light which shineth ever more unto the perfect day. So in the initiation chamber, the vision of the past, present, and future, so you really know where you came from, what you're doing, and what lies ahead. <coughs> In the earlier stages, he sees the glory of his perfected ego or group. Later, the radiance which pours forth from the ray, which carries on its bosom the perfected sons of men of one particular color and type. And later, he gets a glimpse of the perfection of that great being, who is his planetary logos. Now, we got a non-sacred planetary logos, and it's only at the judgment day, about 10 million years from now, that we're going to get rid of two-fifths, <laughs> two-fifths of humanity, and they're going to go to Mars for re-education, eventually to Mars. Uh, they will be those who have developed the concrete mind too much or too little. And then only those, uh, all those human beings on the planet will be on the spiritual path. Judgment Day. The sheep and the goats will be separated. The sheep obviously go to Mars, Aries the ram, and the goats are part of the initiatory process of Capricorn, and they stay on the planet. Okay, well, you know, take a little patience to get there. And where will we be by the time we are there? You know, okay. So, <clears throat> the perfection of his own planetary locus until finally, the perfection of all beauty and the radiance which includes all of the rays of light is revealed, the sun shining in his strength, the solar logos at the moment of consummated purpose. Now, you know, when will that happen? <coughs> We're told that the solar logos, if he plays it right and does well, and there's no guarantee that it will happen, uh, will take the fifth initiation of a cosmic kind in this solar system, but maybe not, maybe only the fourth. And then in the next solar system, will take then the fifth and the sixth initiation. And that's more the moment of consummated glory, especially the seventh initiation is somehow of the solar locus, is the combination of all of them in the eternal now. Those are great words, but, you know, what do they really mean? The seventh synthetic initiation. Well, we'll all be part of it, most likely, but we may be part of it as solar angels or other types of beings. All right. So that's all about vision. <coughs> Do you have any thought about the vision that lies before you, how to contact that? I mean, you'll do that in your ceremony, of course. 
you know, the vision of the high thing, the vision of the work to be done immediately between the initiations that you are currently involved with. You know, for most of us, probably the first and second initiation were probably currently involved. Maybe for some, between the second and third. For none, I can think of between the third and fourth, except a few maybe illustrious people in the world who are like, uh, like obvious for their service to humanity. <clears throat> but what an advantage it is to know the science behind all this stuff and the fact that it's all planned out. And all we have to do is really follow the rules with the right attitude and we will uh, get there. <coughs> Some, there's some. From a, from an Earth perspective, there are some. He basically says that. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of seventh ray, and uh, but he says that in in the Secret Doctrine and also in these books that the Australian Aboriginals, the um, the Bushmen, the 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 Ainus of Japan. And the uh, Vedas of Ceylon do not have the solar angel. What they have is the stimulation of the solar angel, and that their real day of achievement is coming in the next great time period. But they are so close to the spirit of the earth, their true earth humanity, and they, they know something which many people have forgotten. So they, they have their place, but they still have to go through other stages that they haven't gone through yet, you know, uh, certain emotional stages, certain mental stages, and that will all come in the next uh, round, is what Theosophy says about that at the moment. <coughs> I know, you know, there are people who say, look, if we stop meditating, the whole world would fall apart. And they may be right to a certain extent, you know, they're really tr sustaining something. But they also say our time is almost up. And where do we go? You know, we're going someplace else. And they know somehow, intuitively, that inner redirection because they are um, being abstracted from their present forms and sent to inner globes to await the next work. So I don't think these groups are going to survive in physical form so much once they have done the work that they uh, are appointed to do. Um, and, and maybe, you know, they have very little karma, they'll, they'll probably proceed very rapidly. That's what D.K. says. He says, they have little karma. Do you realize what that means, my brother? You know, here we're all burdened with all of our mistakes and karma from the past, and it's really slowed us down, and a lot of these people will be able really to advance. Also, in the fifth uh, round, <coughs> the anthropoid apes, who actually are individualized, will be liberated from their forms. And, you know, that, that went back to the, what do they call it, the um, sin of the mindless uh, in the secret doctrine. And uh, a number of individualized uh, types were trapped in humanoid forms, and that will all end in the, sixth, in the fifth round. And they will have their real opportunity to advance. But you're dealing with a very primitive type of man when you're dealing with the gorilla or the chimpanzee and those types of apes they actually have been. Uh, they, they're somehow in the human stage from the occult point of view. So it's going to be a big, uh, fifth round is going to be really important. Now how long will that take? We're, we're still millions of years ahead when that will happen. But there's plenty to do on the inner planes and uh, we're not going to be lacking for activity of a productive kind. Okay. Ha, 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 ha. <coughs> Cheers. This is water. Not vodka. No. There's that um, yogi, I suppose, melting all the snow around him through the radiation of his uh, etheric body, Tumo Yoga. That's what they gave to Milarepa, the famous yogi saint, uh, his um, 
teacher Marpa gave a special kind of yoga to each of his students. And he knew, prevision, that Milarepa would be meditating in the caves. And uh, it's cold in those caves. And he would need the Tumo Yoga to heat things up around him so he could really do a good job. So, And actually, in the East, they do have uh, melting contests, I understand. Uh, you know, to just see different people with those powers get together and see how much snow they can melt. Uh, so, all these things exist, you know, and we in the West, well, we have a ways to go, but it's coming. Occultism is moving to the West. That's what DK tells us, you know, from the East to the West. <coughs> now, we can't deal with all the rods of power. Let's see, let me just see what our, our, today is uh, Wednesday. Oh, there's a break coming, coming quite soon. Uh, yes, Tuya? You can invite everybody to Finland to melt snow. Okay, so is suggesting that you all come to Finland to melt snow <laughs> with your newly acquired Tuma Yoga powers. Okay, <laughs> okay, this is very good, and uh, if you're very, very good, we're going to go up north of the Arctic Circle to the igloos and all the rest of it. So just hold that in mind. Okay, dear, I'm continuing for a little while. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, See, she's watching everything we do here, <laughs> listening to your responses. Oh, yes, or non-responses, as the case may be. <laughs> okay, rods of power. <coughs> These great talismans which conduct energy from distant sources like Sirius, like the sun, like... Uh, who knows where, whatever is needed for the initiation. You know, it, it only pays to be humble because there's just so much we don't know. You know what I mean? And, and, and if you have the attitude of a know-it-all, you're just closing the door on yourself. Like I said, after enough years and enough failures, you become almost teachable, you know. Then we can actually learn something. Ceremonies of the mysteries and different rods. Well, the cosmic rods, we don't have too much to say about it. Uh, like, uh, for instance, Sirius would, would wield a cosmic rod of initiation, uh, initiating a solar logos. Uh, and of the three major planetary logo, Uranus, uh, Neptune, and Saturn. So these would be wielded by very great beings. And, uh, you know, not much is said. We can only imagine. I have a song about this. I did a song about the four rods of initiation in the Sirius ritual. So, you know, uh, it, it took 15 minutes to make that song. So it's a rather long song, but it features every rod of initiation and what it does. So, <laughs> if you're interested. <coughs> so, uh, at the initiations of Solo Logoi and the three major <coughs> synthesizing <coughs> planets, then we have the cosmic rod. Then we have the systemic rod, used by the solar logos in the initiations of a planetary logos. See, basically, you've got to have a way of conducting energy so that the energy in the chakra is stimulated by the source that has to stimulate it. <coughs> With cosmic initiation, we have nothing to do. It concerns expansions of realization beyond even the ken of the highest initiate in our solar system. Oh, I mean, man, who's the highest initiate in our solar system? Are we talking about planetary logoi, who are the highest initiates? With systemic initiation, we are concerned only in a slight measure, a trifling measure. For they are on so vast a scale that the average human mind cannot as yet envisage them. Envisage, envisage them. Remember, it's called the, the sevenfold flaming fire. That's the name of the solar logoic rod of initiation. Man approaches these initiations insofar as they produce effects in a planetary scheme with which he may be concerned. And, you know, we're taking two initiations right now on our planet. One of them is a minor fourth initiation, hence all the suffering. And another is we're moving towards a cosmic second initiation, so we may, on this planet, learn how to control our cosmic astral body which is not yet the case, as all you have to do is look what's going on on this planet, and you just see the cosmic astral body 
is not controlled. <clears throat> Particularly is this so should the scheme in which he plays a microscopic part be the center in the logoic body receiving stimulation. Well, who are we, really? <coughs> Ultimately, <coughs> we are the base of the spine. So there's a big kundalini thing going on in our solar system right now, and we are being stimulated and on our planet. You know, things are heating up. It's not all uh, hydrocarbons in the air. It's uh, something about the solar logos and the base of the spine. So um, we are receiving stimulation. Venus is, Saturn is, certain of the planets in the solar logoic method is receiving, are receiving stimulation. When that is the case, the initiation of his own planetary logos takes place, and consequently, as he, as a cellular body, receives added stimulation along with the other sons of men. So uh, we have a crucifixion going on here of a minor kind operating through our planetary scheme and especially on our planetary globe, the fourth, fourth initiation, crucifixion. And then we have, <coughs> I don't know when it will be, but it will be probably coinciding with the fifth minor initiation. It will be the second cosmic initiation. And we will become, in fact, uh, not yet really not really a sacred planet, but a kind of sacred planet, you know, on our, on our way. It, you know, he says, well, you can't become a sacred planet unless you have five initiations. But which ones does he mean, the cosmic or the secondary? So that's we're a, a little tricky to, to know how long we have to wait for our sacredness on this planet. It's not going to happen overnight. <coughs> okay. Now, there's, okay, so that's two kinds of uh, rods of initiation. Cosmic, what does he call it? Cosmic. I don't know if he has a name for it. A cosmic rod. And then the sevenfold flaming fire. Now, planetary rods. Used by planetary logos for initiatory purposes and for the third, fourth, and fifth major initiations. With the two higher. So this is going to be, you know, from the time of transfiguration and on a bit, uh, this uh, flaming diamond will be used. Now, we're not in the position where we're going to be facing the flaming diamond yet, but, you know, it'd be nice to face the rod of the Bodhisattva. <coughs> so, all the planetary initiation, at the planetary initiation, the rod of power wielded by the solar logos, is charged with pure electrical force from Sirius. Sirius has a fifth ray soul, very electrical. It has a, a deeper kind of second ray, sixth ray monad, but in terms of manus and the brilliance of mind, Sirius is very, very important from the soul perspective and the fifth ray. <coughs> is charged with pure electrical force from Sirius and was received, this rod, was received by our Logos during the secondary period of creation from the hands of that great entity who is the presiding Lord of the Lords of Karma. Well, that's quite a thing. And the Lords of Karma, of course, as far as we're concerned, do reside on Sirius. There's all kinds of Lords of Karma, but the ones that are closest to us, the law of karma is very, very big on Sirius. So I guess our Logos received this from a certain entity who... Uh, was the uh, director of the Lords of Karma involved with our planet. Okay. <clears throat> he is the repository of the law during manifestation, and he it is who is the representative in the solar system of that greater brotherhood on Sirius, whose lodges are found functioning as the occult hierarchies in different planets. Big lodge on Sirius, and we have an occult hierarchy on every planet, and they're all extensions of the great lodge on Sirius, which we sometimes call the Blue Lodge. And we sometimes call Sirius the Blue Star. <coughs> okay. Again, it is he who, with the solar logos to assist him, invests the various initiators with power, like Sanakumara, for instance. Gives to them that word in secret which enables them to draw down the pure electric force with which their rod of office must be charged and commits to their keeping the peculiar secret of their particular planetary scheme, and that's not going to be revealed to us except in little 
pieces, initiation after initiation. We say, oh, we know all about our planetary scheme, but we don't. There's all depths of mystery involved with our planetary scheme, and we just get to learn a little bit, a little bit, a little bit as the initiations go on. <coughs> so our planetary scheme involves what's called the commitment to the light. We're supposed to, we were supposed to be a great light station in the solar system. And, you know, finally, we are a powerhouse of Ray 1 energy. But if you're not a sacred planet yet, your monadic energy is occultly ineffective, non-effective. So until we really take some of those initiations which make us a sacred planet, our monadic energy of the first ray will not really be coming through. And it better come through, otherwise the solar logos won't be able to take his fifth initiation. So we are tied to our solo logos, because he needs his base of the spine center to take the fifth initiation. <coughs> so we better progress. And then there are other rods. This is the one, maybe, that concerns us most. It's used by an occult hierarchy for minor initiations and for the first two initiations of Manas by the Bodhisattva. It's called the Bodhisattva's rod. Now, he describes these things, how the serpents intertwine and the beautiful uh, display that goes on during the initiation ceremony, the rod of the Bodhisattva is much more uh, simple than the um, flaming diamond rod, which initiates us at the third, fourth, fifth, and beyond initiations. <coughs> when man individualized in Lemurian days, it was through the application of the rod of initiation to the logos of our earth chain. Now, Logoi. Is there a logos of the planet? Is there a logos of the chain? Is there a logos of the scheme? See, all these beings, they do exist. We usually think, well, the planetary logos. But there's different parts. Every chain has a logos. Every globe has a globe lord or a logos. So some big initiator initiated, uh, applied the rod of initiation to our earth chain and touched into activity certain centers in his body and their corresponding groups. And this application produced literally the awakening of the life to intelligent work on the mental plane, individualization in other words. Animal man was conscious on the physical and on the astral planes, but not mental yet, not mental. <coughs> so the whole thing about individualization was an act of initiation. And some greater being, probably the soul of Logos, uh, touched our Logos with the necessary fire to stimulate this new method of elevation. <coughs> by the stimulation affected by the electrical rod, this animal man awoke to consciousness on the mental plane. And that's many of us, many of us maybe, in long past, unless, of course, we came from the moon chain and then it was done differently. You see, then it was just a gradual process of the ego and the man approaching each other and not an initiator to do it. Thus, uh, were the three bodies coordinated and the thinker, <coughs> who is the soul, enabled to function through them. So the effects of the different rods, um, what happens with the rods? What do they do in a practical sense? <coughs> well, the latent fires are stimulated, and they blaze forth. And then the fires are synthesized uh, through an occult activity that brings them they swing into each other's radius. So they produce triangles and other geometrical figures. Not just alone, they become a unit of circulating fire. Uh, there's an increase of vibratory activity of some center, depending upon your initiation. You know, it's going to be, well, let's just say the sacral center is going to be really important at the first degree, the solar plexus at the second, the asthma center at the third, the heart at the fourth, the base of the spine at the fifth, and so forth. Those are the things that are going to be touched by the rod. <coughs> so, expansion of all the bodies will occur, but primarily your soul body. You know, there's a big difference between looking at a really early human being where there's not much color in the egoic lotus and everything's folded down and it's quite pale, and then looking at an almost fourth degree initiate. And with all the colors, all the sounds, the jewel in the lotus is... Uh, 
radiating forth. So, you know, it'd be kind of interesting. The, the master can see our causal body. We uh, can't. And I don't know if we should, but, uh, you know, it would be kind of interesting to see what we've really done, what our progress really has been. Are we really unfolding the sacrifice petals? None of us is at the position where the jewel in the lotus is blazing forth. That would mean we're taking the fourth initiation. The arousing of the kundalini fire. That's what happens with the application of the rod, the fire of the base of the spine, and the geometrical direction of its upward progression. If you just think, I'm going to do kundalini yoga and I'm going to breathe myself into a state of enlightenment, you're going to be in trouble because the science of geometrical progression will not be um, applied and you'll damage yourself, you see. Okay. This fire and the fire of Manus are directed along certain routes or triangles by, and by the following as the rod uh, of the rod as it moves in a specific manner. Now, Sanat Kumara has to know a lot to do it the right way. You know, uh, it's, it's all such a science. Uh, there's a definite occult reason under the law of electricity behind the known fact that every initiate presented to the initiator is accompanied by two masters who stand on either side. Probably one represents positive electricity, the other uh, negative electricity, and the, the, the candidate represents what he calls neutral or balanced uh, electricity. Probably that is the case. The three of them together form a triangle which makes the work possible. Those are called your sponsors. Probably at some point, your master, whoever that may be, becomes one of your sponsors. It'll probably all be according to the ray of your soul, at least in the beginning. Okay. So the force of the rod is twofold, and he, he really says it, its power is terrific. You know, we, we sometimes think that we have atomic energy now, and we have atom bombs and hydrogen bombs, and we have all that kind of thing, but this is the real power. And, uh, you know, if that kind of power were ever released into human knowledge, given our present morality and the way we're getting along with each other, we would certainly uh, destroy it all. <coughs> Apart and alone, the initiate could not receive the voltage of the rod without serious hurt to his causal body and to his other vehicles. But in triangular transmission, that's the balancing figure, comes safety. And that's the reason for the sponsors. And it's even that way now, you know, with the masonry and so forth. You have sponsors, uh, people that have um, are aware of your application and they've kind of seen you through and all that kind of thing. They stand as sponsors. <coughs> The energy is not the same, of course. You know, it's symbolic. You know, it's symbolic. But probably something comes through, and one feels definitely uplifted. We need to remember that there are that the two masters that sponsor all applicants for initiation and represent here the two masters sponsor all applicants for initiation and represent two polarities of the electric all. I'm, I'm sure that the candidate himself is that unknown solar fire neutral electricity and the two sponsors are the plus and the minus. Part of their function is to stand with the applicant for initiation when they come before the great Lord, whether that is the Christ or whether that is the Lord of the world. <coughs> One rod of initiation is used for the first two initiations and is wielded by the great Lord, which we normally call the Christ. It is magnetized by the application of the flaming diamond and the magnetization being repeated for each new world teacher. 2,500 years ago, the Christ became the, um, the head of the hierarchy. He became the initiator for the first two initiations. Therefore, the flaming diamond touched his rod and re-magnetized it for his use. It's quite a battery charge, you know what I mean? We get our batteries charged these days, but this is the real thing. There was a wonderful ceremony performed at the time that a new world teacher takes office in which he receives his rod of power. The same rod as used since the foundation of the planetary hierarchy, but charged for him. Okay, and uh, who knows how. Uh, uh, and holds it forth to the Lord of the world who touches it with his own 
mighty rod, the, the, the flaming diamond. So, this, you know, this is the occult inner stuff that really changes our consciousness, changes what we see and perceive and can do. This is not just theoretical, this is the real, real thing. Causing a fresh recharging of its electrical capacity, and the ceremony takes place at Shambhala. Not necessarily in the Gobi Desert. It's taking place on the seventh subplane of the cosmic physical plane. That's where Shambhala will be found. <coughs> okay. The rod of initiation known as the Flaming Diamond is used by Sanat Kumara, the one initiator. <coughs> it is produced only at stated times when specific work has to be done. It is not used only at the initiating of men, but at certain planetary functions of which nothing is at present known. So it's a planetary rod as well as a rod for the third, fourth, and fifth initiation. Now you can imagine that a great being is somehow touching your energy system. You know, um, and in that type of imagination, maybe some resonance occurs of what that touch will really be like. But basically, we have to prepare ourselves for this. We're not hurrying ourselves along. We are making haste slowly and deliberately, as Mary Bailey used to say, advancing with all due deliberate speed, like a British battleship. Okay. <laughs> She was a very first ray uh, lady. <coughs> so it is uh, certain planetary functions. It has its place and function in certain ceremonies connected with the inner round and the triangle formed by Earth, Mars, and Mercury. It gives us the hint that something's going on on an inner group of invisible planets on these particular planets, which offers unusual opportunity to those who choose that very tempting and dangerous way. So the inner round is, uh, it has its dangers and its great uh, opportunities. I mean, look, and what do we know about this stuff? You know, we're just people, we're going along, we have our lives to lead, we try to do good, we try to support the spiritual work in the world, we try to know something, and we're just at the beginning. And we have to admit that. Have to admit that. And then, like I say, we become almost teachable. Okay. <coughs> the scepter, you know, like kings have scepters, right? The scepter of a ruling monarch at this day is hidden. In, the, in that is hidden the symbolism of these various rods. You know what I mean? The king has a scepter, and it's sort of a rod, you know. And, and when you think about it, the judge with the gavel, boom, you know, that's another way, a very Vulcanian way of expressing the power of Vulcanian impact. So, um, these are duly recognized as symbols of office and power, but it is not generally appreciated that they are of electrical origin. The great mystery of electricity is kind of unknown to us. And he says it's going to be that which is revealed along with the mysteries of initiation. He says it's its own thing, it's a fifth-rate thing, it's not Masonic, it's not the New World religion, it's not necessarily the esoteric schools, it's its own thing. The fifth-ray revelation of the mystery of electricity. <coughs> and that their true significance is concerned with the dynamic stimulation of all the subordinates in office who come under their touch. You know how it is, the energy you convey will help those who are assisting you and the energy that they convey will help those assisting them. And we must transmit these energies. Otherwise, the divine circulatory flow is interrupted. So, you know, I'm sometimes aware, here I am kind of sick. I wonder if I'm transmitting any energy or if you're just getting my bug. You know, that's... <laughs> <coughs> inspiring them to increased activity and service for the race. The one thing we really have to do is inspire people. He tells us the hierarchy works through inspiration. This whole Seven Ray Institute, University of Seven Rays conference is supposed to be all about inspiration. It's supposed to be a point of contact for people so that when they leave, they can really 
be all charged up and have something for the whole year. So, you know, and we call on the powers that be for that inspiration and we try to communicate it. <coughs> <coughs> now, um, I think it's time, there's a break time here. Let's just see something quickly. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to do all this. I don't think we can do all this. Um, I'll have to s summarize. Um, let's just say these rods are not just kept anywhere, you know, in your pantry or in your closet, okay? The hierarchical, hierarchical mess hall. No. It lies hidden in the heart of wisdom. The rod of the Bodhisattva is hid in Shambhala. Guarded, well guarded by certain uh, Devic lives. The rod of the one initiator, the flaming diamond, is hidden in the east. Not much is said. A definite planetary location. The rod of the solar logos is hidden in the heart of the sun. That mysterious subjective sphere which lies back of our physical sun and of which our physical sun is but the environing uh, shield and envelope. So is it from the cosmic astral plane or is it from the cosmic mental plane where the soul nature of the solar logos anyway something cosmic is involved for the hiding of this rod you can only imagine how the black lodge would love to get his hands on these rods you know so the so the the groups that use them have to be very uh, cautious they can't let too much of the plan out they don't want the black lodge to know the nature of the plan and they don't really yet and so they're extremely cautious about what they reveal to us and so that we will not, through error, reveal to the Black Lodge. The rod of the Cosmic Logos is secreted in that central spot in the heavens around which our solar system revolves and which is termed, termed the central spiritual sun. Where do you think the rod of the Cosmic Logos is located? <coughs> Well, Sirius is very important, but all these solar systems don't revolve around Sirius, per se. But they do revolve around a cosmic center. The Pleiades? The Pleiades? The Pleiades? Well, the galactic center, that's another step up. But, but here, we all revolve around Alcyone and Sirius and that great cluster. That's where the cosmic rod... And look, we're not even into galactic rods and the rods of the arms of the galaxies, you know, it just goes on and on. Beyond a certain point, you just can't, what's the use of even saying, except that they do exist. So, um, somewhere in the solar system is the seven-fold flaming fire, somewhere in the Pleiades is the cosmic rod, and somewhere on our planet, <clears throat> which we call the East, who knows what that is, is the flaming diamond, and in Shambhala is the rod of the Bodhisattva hidden. This is, they all take this very seriously, you know. This is uh, <coughs> not anything that is lightly to be managed. It's a supreme science, so they do no harm. You know, it's all, you know, if you're suggested for initiation prematurely, harm. Too late, harm. It all has to be beautifully timed so that the time comes when it's right time and when the astrology allows you to do it. Now, you may have to wait a life, if your karmic astrology doesn't quite allow you, because you had so much to make up, to have the right indicators for that initiation. But generally speaking, if, and who knows how many combinations it might be uh, that will allow you to take initiation, it has to be astrological right time. <coughs> okay. Yeah, I have to... Um, well, you know, there's some details here. Um, the rod, one rod is charged for the new world teacher. The rod of Sanakumara charged every world period. What's a world period? What is, when we say a world period, what do we mean by that?
One round. World period is a round. <coughs> so charged. Every chain round, probably every chain round. There's two kinds of rounds. One has to do with seven cycles in a planetary chain, and the other has to do with seven cycles throughout the whole planetary scheme, from chain to chain to chain. Now, just how all that works out, you know, it's, it's difficult to say. Anyway, uh, the logoic rod uh, is electrified for each new solar system. How many solar systems have we had? Okay, so thus far, thus far, that's one, far, okay. So I hear one, do I hear, do I hear two? <coughs> do I hear five? Okay, so we've had one preceding major solar system. This is the second major solar system and another to follow. We have had four preceding solar systems, three of them minor, one of them major. So this is really the fifth solar system. And you know how the numbers five and two go together. They, they, you know, they represent that whole solar angelic. They are the solar angelic numbers. So the ceremonies take place at Shambhala, the first two, uh, and the sacred point of our planetary manifestation, the central location in our physical planet, you know, hints, 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 where, 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 which corresponds to the heart of a human being. The first two ceremonies for the Bodhisattva's rod and the rod of Sanatumara. Many of the places on the surface, earths, for instance, which are famed for their healing properties, are thus noted because they are magnetized spots, and their magnetic properties demonstrate as healing influences. So the rods can be used in that respect. We know there are healing places. I wouldn't say the Dobson necessarily is. We manage to get sick when we come to the Dobson, but there are other places uh, which are healing spots on the earth. <coughs> the recognition of these properties by man is but the preamble of a later and more definite recognition which will eventuate in his etheric site, uh, which will be normally developed. And they've already affected the ethers. Like at night, you know, if you're in a semi-dark room, you just see a lot of stuff da dancing around. And that's because the ethers have been really uh, affected. They've been promoted. So, so not only do you see it with your own eye, but there's more to see. So we're entering into that etheric age now. Okay? <coughs> okay, I think that's enough for the moment. And we'll take a 15-minute break. And uh, I won't be able to finish all of this, but Tuya will finish you off when it comes to the ceremony. Oh, probably not. You know, you never can tell who's hiding among you, for whom the sixth initiation might be just the thing. Anyway, what, what we are doing at the, at the present moment is talking about the effects on the bodies, which is, you know, that, that's your own body, of course. And um, the effect upon the echoic body, that's important. And let's see if there's anything else. That's all the body, body, body. And uh, let's see what the next, I'm not going to go through this in exhaustive detail. Let's just say the next one is the oath. Five more pages and you get to swear that you will never violate the oath. Okay? People say, I don't want to do that, you know? How, why do you make me swear? I don't like that. My personality doesn't like it, but it's part of every initiation ceremony. All right, 15 minutes then.